my father was doing a satellite TV sta- uh, program for many years in DC that was beaming, you know, across the world. So I used to go with him. And as a result of uh, doing that, that's where I first heard about this whole th- thing called the October Surprise. That some people call in and said, by the way, did you know that there were meetings at the Mayflower Hotel in D.C. and that these people were involved, you know, with Reagan's campaign staff? This must have been easily 20 years after everything had happened, you know, maybe more. And then living in the United States for 38 years, the one thing, you know, all these American folks that I've had the pleasure to meet and talk to who are always very generous, very decent. They always say, you know, the one thing that makes us angry or unhappy is the uh, hostage affair. You know, they talk about, you know, it, it's still in people's memories. And and I feel like I almost have an obligation to clear, clear the air, you know, say, hold on, <laughs> hold on. The hostages weren't kept for that extended period of time by the Iranians alone. It would be really nice, I think, to gain your perspective now, looking back, whether you now have a sense that it wasn't a solely an Iranian affair. I'd like to get your perspective on it as somebody who was you know, immediately affected by it, probably knows more about it than anybody else, including me. It still casts a shadow over the relationship, just like the 1953 coup. Yes, Yes. does the same thing. And we sort of have these mutual grievances. Each side has had a difficult time facing up to it. The government or the regime or whatever you want to call it in Iran uh, still pretends that what happened was a good thing. Now, the interesting part of it is that at least some of the participants have gone public and said, you know, Ma, Ma, Ajab, she can't afford you. Yep. Uh, yeah, what a mistake. We yeah. really screwed up. Yep, yep. I mean, I, I saw an interview with Jimmy Carter. You know, he was asked, you know, do, do you think anything was done behind the scenes with the Iranians? And he said, uh, you know, I, I need to see the evidence. He never confronted it directly as a fact of the elections. I mean, here we are 44 years later. I mean, have you... Well, what's what's been out. your... The evidence is out. Um, if you remember, it came out last year. Okay. In, in March when... The New York Times ran a story about former Governor Connolly of Texas right. and his deputy going around the Arab world passing the messages yes. Yes. to the Iranians. Why they went to like Saudi Arabia and Egypt, who were not really very good with the Iranians, but they did. It was a story that back in 1980, right. I mean, while we were inside, now, of course, we we had no idea what was going on because we were incommunicado. We had no right. news, no newspapers. We were kept ignorant. I don't think our captors had any idea what was going on. You know, they were right. the people who were benefiting from this were in control, and these uh, these these uh, kids I call them kids, yeah, children, yeah, um, were basically prison guards, right. That was all they were. Right. And they had no information. They were they were not part of any political process. And neither were we. I mean, we didn't know anything. We didn't know any. We we knew less. I mean, we knew nothing. But apparently in Tehran in those days, the word was out. People on the street knew about it. Yes. Yes. And I tell you how how, you know, one way I found out it was through my wife, who in those days, while I was in, while I was, uh, you know, uh, how, would, how would I say, a guest, she was working at our consulate in Saudi Arabia, mm-hmm. and a lot of Iranians would come through. They would come on the uh, pretext of doing uh, Omrah, mm-hmm. um, and then come for visas to the U.S. Mm-hmm. And she would talk to them. Now mm-hmm. she didn't say who she was. Uh, But she would say, what's going on? And she said, oh, you know, the fix is in between the Reagan people and the Mullahs. And as soon as Carter is out, you know, they want to get Carter. They both want to get Carter out. Right. So as soon as Carter is out, everything will be okay. Now, this is like 1980. And these are ordinary people. I mean, you know, shopkeepers, employees. Who knew? Who knew? Not politicians. Right. Right. But... I mean, word was out. In 1980, you know, maybe Jimmy Carter didn't have any evidence, but in 1980, the ordinary man on the street in Tehran knew about this. 
He knew what yes. was going on. Yes, yes, uh, but and- but but Americans don't. Even up to today, one article in the New York Times, and it's just not well known. And as an Iranian American, I feel like it's my obligation to at least let people know, somehow know, that yes, there were a lot of bad characters on the Iranian side, but there were also some pretty bad characters here working behind the scenes illegally well, conducting well, foreign policy. Basically, they saw they saw yeah. an opportunity, and and especially this, you know, a, a lot of this traces back to the late uh, Bill Casey. Yes, he was Bill Casey, Reagan's campaign manager, central, and central to all this. You know, to give him credit, yeah, he saw an op. He said, "Hey, wait a minute, we can use this to get Reagan elected." Yes, and you know, the idea of serving the country, you know, uh, or of keeping us another four or five months in in Tehran, you know, that didn't didn't concern him at all. Now I'll go forward a little bit. Okay, so my wife is hearing this this stuff, you know, from ordinary Iranians, but you know, nobody's really paying much attention to this. And they're, they're saying, oh no, this is just conspiracy thinking, so forth and so on. In January of 1981, we get released. Released it within seconds of when Reagan gets inaugurated. Yeah, now that should make you think about things. Yeah, I think um, everybody questioned why, but nobody really understood. And the narrative, you know, has always been, well, Reagan said if they weren't released, we were going to make Tehran a parking lot or we were going to nuke Tehran or something. That's been the Republican line for 40 years. The Iranians could have released us after the election. I think they wanted to stick it to to Carter. I mean, well, Romania no, they were still just... they were still negotiating the Algiers Treaty. So we were released, mm-hmm. you know. 15 minutes after mm-hmm. Carter Lee, a few days later, a week later, we arrive in the States. Mm-hmm. Okay, I meet my wife. This is in New York. This is upstate New York. I meet yeah. my wife by the plane, and we get on the bus to go to West Point. She turns to me and says, you know, you were there longer than you needed to be. <laughs> you should have been released, you know, four months yeah. later. Okay. And I've always said, well, you know, I'm sure she's probably right. You know, she says, look, every Iranian that I saw told me this, this is what was going on because of the Reagan people. And I said, yeah, but you know, there's, where's the, I said, I'm like, where's the evidence? Where's, where's mm-hmm. the, where's the proof? And, you know, Gary Sick writes his book in not 1992, 1993. Right. And Barbara and Honiger, uh, Robert Perry, there's like three or four books. Bob Perry and Bob Perry, yeah. all of that gets poo-pooed because people yeah. say, well, there's um, there's no evidence. Well, it turns out, you know, 40 some years later yes. that she was right. Yes. And, yes. and they were right. And she could say to me, you know, she perfectly justified in saying to me, well, I told you so, you know. Yes. You, you yes. didn't believe me. Uh, yes. You didn't believe me. Kind of like you know, everybody knew except 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 us. you. <laughs> well, let me let me ask you a question. Or here's my postulation. Let me put it this way: that this thing didn't stop in Iran. There's been outcomes from it that are very very serious for the United States. That this wasn't just an election that was manipulated, but there were some real outcomes. One of the most critical this was that uh, Saddam Hussein invading Iran on September 22nd of 1980 was a direct outcome of this hostage crisis. Oh, and that no there's question. No, no question, question about it, right? The day before we were the embassy was taken. Right. We were negotiating with the Iranians over right. how to deliver spare parts. Right. for their military. Right. I think it was for the air for the for the aircraft. And we were willing to do it. Had it not been for breaking that supply relationship and breaking right. that military relationship, right. Saddam, I don't think Saddam would have ever done what he did. Another thing that happened is about a month before the embassy was taken, we had a, a team in Tehran which was briefing the, the provisional, gov- provisional yeah. government about right. the Iraqis. Right. And what right. they were doing. It would have been in our interest. We wanted to continue that. Mm-hmm. military, to, at least the military to military relationship. Yes. yes. You know, yes. the political relationship, okay, maybe it's going to be different, but the right. military-military relationship, we want right. to continue. Um, and a lot of Iranians did too. 
a couple of things happened, not only the Iran-Iraq war, but by the way, the, in the Iranian circles, there was some this talk of that Brzezinski, uh, Jimmy Carter's national security officer, had visited with Iraq's generals in Jordan in August, about a month or two before the invasion, and also that the, son, the Shah's son, Reza Pahlavi, had met with them also in the U.S. They, they came in on diplomatic passports and shared deep insight on Iran, Iran's military installations just to help Saddam Hussein do a good job of the invasion. Let's put it that way. For me, pretty clear that there was a lot of activity prior to the invasion that would have made Saddam Hussein feel that it was the right thing to do, you know, right opportunity to take. If that war hadn't happened, the two subsequent wars wouldn't have happened, which I think had a profound effect on the United States economically, politically, I mean, in so many ways. No, no, I don't think it, Ronald. And by 1980, what, 5, 86, 87, right. the U.S. was openly supporting Saddam. Right. right. Um, and it's one of the, frankly, sh more shameful chapters in our history mm -hmm. that, for example, after the events at Halabje, in mm -hmm. March of um, the, the chemical main, warfare, chemical warfare attack, yeah. 1970, uh, 1980, what was it? 1988, uh, March of 1988, uh, the U.S. made a very weak response. And that remains to me, that's a shameful to hide that for the end of the war, we were openly in support of the Iraqis. Yes, but there's been some, some national security documents that have been released very recently that even suggest that we supplied some of the intermediates for the chemical agents. That's not high tech. No, no. That's not that's high no tech, tech yes. stuff. I mean, the German, the, the people did that in 1915. <laughs> they yes. were using chemicals. Exactly. The other outcome besides the two wars that from an American perspective is horrific was that, of course, there was arms sales to Iran through Israel, through Guatemala, through Paraguay, and that these planes were flown with arms to Iran. So the war was sort of extended, leading to hundreds of thousands of more deaths. But also with the profits from that, they came and bought cocaine from Nicaragua and brought it into the United States. And the whole sort of the Iran-Contra affair, there's been several people that have recently come out of jail. One of them is Freeway Ricky Ross, who was a cocaine dealer in California, who's basically said that he, he was told to go to swing states, Florida, Ohio, and in, in his primary market in LA and distribute all this cocaine that was being delivered. And he was handing over some weekends, $80 million a weekend to Ollie North's gang with a design to get African-Americans in jail and out of the voting booths to impact the ele election, subsequent election outcomes. And I don't know if you've heard of all this. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering. No, I, no I haven't. Yeah. But, you know, if, if you're sending money into narco states, Exactly. It's not, it's not a stretch to right. figure out what's going to happen with that money, where exactly. that money's going to go. To questionable uh, characters. No, I, specifically, yeah. I don't, you know, uh, specifically, I, I don't know about that. But, I, you know, I do know that if you call it the success of the operation back in 1980, the operation to defeat Jimmy Carter right. by using arms sales. Yes, via the Israelis, by appearances, it seemed to, for, to seem to be successful for the Republic. However, in 1985, they tried to repeat it with the Iranians to supply arms in the whole Iran-Contra yes. affair. Only they're so damn incompetent, the whole thing blows up in their face. Their plane, uh, you know, uh, dropped in Nicaragua, Hassan Fuss or whatever were arrested by yeah. the opposition in Nicaragua, and then it blew up in Congress, and there were all these hearings, which, by the way, were stage managed. I mean, it was theater, and the people running those congressional shows, you know, John Tower and John Hines, both dead. Yeah. Both, you know, yeah. somehow, mi miraculously, April, whatever whatever it was, April 1st and April 2nd, 1990, they're both, their planes drop out of the air with questionable landing gear or whatever it was. The whole thing just blew up. And, and nobody talks about it. Nobody even mentions it at all these days, you know. According to the new biography of Reagan, the biographer says Reagan didn't know about any of this. Casey and his people were doing this and, and Reagan knew nothing about it. Knowing Reagan, I find that believable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, but, he really lived in his own world. But George Bush would have known. 
George Bush might have known. Yeah, George Bush's role is very suspicious. Yes, former know. CIA director, but he was also apparently in meetings with the Iranians in Paris in October of 1980. And he handed wow. over the $40 yeah. million dollars in cash to them, you know, as a down payment, basically. I mean, what, what's kind of sh uh, shocking was that the Republicans went to the Iranians while Carter was still president. And yes. said, very early on and said, we'll give you, if we win the election, it's in your interest, we'll give you a better deal. To show our good faith, they arranged an arms shipment via Israel. Yes, yes. All, all of this while Carter has Iran under an embargo. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Pamela. No, I mean, no, no. It's just so incredibly true. Bottom line, uh, what I want is better relations between the two countries. Sure. And if both parties can somehow fess up, <laughs> it could be part of a reconciliation or part of a sort of a pathway to better relations, you know. And I think the people alone can make the better relations happen because I think Iranians have a natural affinity to Western values in the United States. And uh, it can kind of go on automatic if we can only just create the conditions for a better relationship between the two countries. You know, that was our, uh, it's, it sounds funny when I say this, I mean, you could laugh at me, in 1979, essentially that was our mission at the U.S. Embassy. I mean, that was our mission in Tehran to establish, you know, some kind of relationship. It doesn't have to be friends. You know, there are a lot of countries with which we're not friends, but we have relations and we talk about when we need to talk, we need to talk about things. And that was the kind of relationship we could envision with the new system in Iran, whatever it was going to be. And they say, look, you still need to have oil. You still have problems with your neighbors. It's in our interest to talk to each other. Yes. You know, not to threaten each other or denounce each other or make accusations to each other. I mean, that was essentially our mission. And, right. um, I, you know, I've argued, and I just, you know, I feel as you do, I've argued that, you know, it's not that we necessarily need to be friends, but we need to be able to talk to each other. Yes. Now, if we yes. become friends down the line, so much the better. Right. But, you know, at least a relationship where we stop yelling at each other. Right, right. That's exactly stop threatening it. each other. Well, well that, that, that's what I want. Other. But that's my that's my mission with the movie. That's my mission generally as a person. And I believe, John, regardless of what people say or what, how people behave or whatever, if you, you're on the side of the fundamental truth, the fundamental correct thing to do, you just stick with it and people will eventually come around. It may take longer. You hold your course. You stay resolute. So I'm hopeful that we can rebuild between the two nations somehow in the next four years or so. That's my hope. John, I, I really, really appreciate your time. You've been wonderful.